many legendary figures emerge from the wild west of Wall Street. Some are known for their spectacularly good traits, some for their spectacularly bad traits, some for price gouging, some for beating the market for years. But Carl Icahn? Well, he's known for something else. You don't have the balls to do what I'll tell you to do. Get rid of all of them tomorrow. I get a call from this uh, Ackman guy. And I'm telling you, he's like the crybaby in the schoolyard. You know, I went to a tough school in Queens. That they used to beat up the little Jewish boys. And he was like one of these little Jewish boys crying that the world was taking advantage of him. Street smart kid from Brooklyn, Carl Icahn grew up with one goal make as much money as possible, no matter what. Part of my values is to make money, and I can't change my values. I mean, some people love art, so, you know, love to paint. If a great painter loves to paint, well, you can't, what do you do, criticize him because he likes to paint? He hustles here and there, but in 1978, he finds his calling. Hostile corporate takeovers, or in other words, taking companies by force. For most, hostile takeovers aren't worth it. They're high-risk plays, very public and bloody affairs. Icon doesn't mind though, he believes there's money to be made doing it. At first he doesn't mind getting his hands bloody, and it's not long before he develops a taste for it. I like to see the light go out. Icon makes corporate takeovers look easy, turning it into an art. Of the people in his business, people are in the business of taking over companies. There's no one who is more persistent and more determined in what they do than he is. And takeover Icon did, company after company, with ruthless efficiency. How do I find a friend on Wall Street? Uh, Mr. Icon suggested you'd be better off buying a dog. As he rakes in fortunes, the media dubs him a corporate raider, stunned by his systematic conquering of company after company. TWA's in-house magazine ran a story called Who's Afraid of Carl Icon? Behind closed doors, firms whisper about Carl. Every management division has heard of his bloodlust, and they shiver at the thought of being acquired by Icon. They wait and watch, but just like a shark, by the time you notice him, it is already too late. Carl Icahn is born in a poor neighborhood in Queens, New York, a single child of two teachers. His upbringing can only be described as harsh. He grows up tough as nails on the mean streets of New York. As a young Jew, he's often picked on and frequently gets into fights. Carl learns quick to jab, dive and ultimately what it takes to survive. His father is distant and detached, a cantor by trade. His inability to fulfill his dream of being a professional singer left him a bitter man. My father was never able to accomplish anything. He was a strange guy. I never respected him. Icon's mother, Bella, is two sides of a coin. She loves her son and cares for him, but can also be demanding and domineering. In other ways, she wanted him to go to medical school, but they were both very intense people. He had a tough childhood. The only family member Carl admires is his uncle Elliot, an entrepreneur. You see, Elliot lives in Scarsdale, another city in New York. But when Icon visits, it's like he's entering a whole new world. His eyes sparkle as he enters. Big houses, fast cars, maids that wait on people hand and foot. While the opulent life is something Carl's father hates with a passion, Carl himself instantly recognizes that this is the way to live. From the beginning, Elliot is like a big brother to Carl and nurtures his wild dream of becoming rich. But how to actually achieve it? How can the boy who has nothing become one of the richest men alive? And so I really wanted to get out of there. I was real smart in school and I had good marks. I took the college boards and I, I think I did the best in, in Queens or something on him. With his ambition lit, Carl starts defying the odds from a young age. A bookworm by nature, he does extremely well in school. While he goes to the local grade school, he's offered a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. A scholarship to Woodmere Academy, an illustrious private school. A rare offer, and to Carl, it's his first chance to really go somewhere. All he needs is his parents to sign off. But when he hands the offer to his 
parents. They forbid it, concerned over the values he'd be exposed to. A blow to the gut, but Carl doesn't give up. Later, he applies to Ivy League universities. No one in the history of his high school has ever been accepted into an Ivy League university. It just doesn't happen, but it does for Icon. And he gets accepted into all of them and he decides to go to Princeton. Number one among schools listed in the national universities category. I wanted Princeton. But then when it came to thinking about paying the tuition, which was only $750 in those days, and the room and board was $750. My father said, son, we're not gonna go back on the work. We're gonna pay your tuition. I said, thanks, Dad, that's great. I appreciate it greatly. And then it hit me. I said, what about room and board, Dad? And then he said, you're a smart kid. You've got to worry about the room and board yourself. Even with tuition covered, Carl still got to pay his way. So he gets creative. He works as a cabana boy on Lido Beach, watching rich people sunbath and sip martinis. The life he craves. One day while working, he spots some people playing a card game and watches. It's poker and they invite him to play. Although he loses, he picks up four books on the game. And the more he learns, the more he wins. Eventually he makes double his salary in a weekend playing poker. And that's how I paid my room and board throughout Princeton. He graduates from Princeton with a degree in philosophy, even writing an award-winning thesis on the empiricist criterion of meaning, whatever that means. But Icahn's no closer to his goal and faced with the decision to commit to a profession for the rest of his life, he now feels lost. The man who will become a ruthless shark finds himself without a sense of direction. A drift on the ocean, Icon will go wherever the current takes him. I got accepted to medical school and I really didn't want to go. I didn't want to be a doctor. But my mother was so adamant. She said, it's an anti-Semitic world, therefore be a doctor. Deep down, he knows he doesn't want it. He never has, but his mother insists and pressures him. Eventually he caves and enrolls in the New York University of Medicine. Even though he's good at medicine, he hates it. Torn between appeasing his mother and doing something he wants to do, Icon spends two long years studying before he reaches a breaking point. What did your mother say when you dropped out of medical school? Was she disappointed? That's just a euphemism. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you, you, you needn't come home anymore. You made the great mistake of your life. Icon's just as lost as when he started. So he goes to one place his mom won't find him, the army. He doesn't do a lot of book learning there, but he learns discipline, he hones his killer instinct and he plays poker, a lot of poker. And he manages to net $20,000 hustling his comrades. That's equivalent to $200,000 today. And yet even more importantly, while in the army, he finally figures out what he wants to do. He wants to make money the way Uncle Elliot does in business. And just like that, the boy floating with the current finally has a lighthouse to swim to. The mission is clear, make some serious money. With his hair combed and his suit ironed, Icon wheel and deals on Wall Street. His uncle Elliot helps him get his first gig as a broker at Dryfoos Corporation, an investment management firm. At first, he kills it. Life was good and I figured this is the easiest damn thing I ever did. But just like the saying goes, good things don't last forever. In 1962, the market crashes and Icon loses almost all he's made as a broker. I learned a great lesson. You always pay for Huber. So he gets into options instead. Something you have to understand is, at the time, the options world was a dangerous place filled with scammers, the kind that sell their own mothers for a quick buck. These bandits play all sorts of tricks on the naive, selling options for way more than they are worth or dressing up crappy options to look like the next big investment opportunity. And because options are a more complicated investing tool, especially in those days, they get away with it. 
Carl sees an opportunity and starts the Midweek Options Report, a newsletter advising people on options. This is what you should have been getting for your option, and this is what you got. And you got screwed. Over the next few years, people flock to his newsletter, a light in the dark dealings of the option underworld. This allows him to build a huge network and make a name for himself as a reputable and respectable professional, both of which come in handy later. Still, to be considered a true player, in those days, you needed to have a seat on the stock exchange. When the asking price for a seat is too high, Carl pays a visit to none other than his uncle. Elliot Schnall, known as Uncle Elliot, helped Carl Icahn get started. In 1968, he loaned Icahn $400,000 so he could buy a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. With the cash needed, Carl is able to finally buy a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. With that, he founds Icon and Co., his very own company. Icon says he's helping the real owners of the company, the shareholders. Similar to poker, he's worked his way up to the high rollers. He's bought a seat at the table and brought his chips. Not only does he intend to play, he intends on winning. In fact, he quickly racks up an estimated fortune of $100 million by betting on the successful completion of mergers and acquisitions. Let me say it again. $100 million. Doesn't it just roll right off the tongue? Do you have any idea what you'd do with $100 million? Maybe you'd quit working on the spot, retire in the Bahamas, and Icon's done it. The boy who came from nothing now has it all. Money, prestige, power. The life he's craved, the life he's dreamed of. And yet for Icon, $100 million isn't a golden retirement fund. It's a war chest, and Icon's about to set the world ablaze. A finance career is one way to get to 100 million US dollars, but another option that has been becoming more and more attractive is a tech career. Salaries in tech are going through the roof, and it's even possible to break into some roles without having a university degree. That's why I was so happy to come across Course Careers and give you guys a little freebie. If you want to start a high paying career in the technology industry but don't have previous experience or a degree, then Course career is here to help. They are replacing college as the modern way people are starting careers and it's so simple. All you do is go through an affordable online course where you learn everything required to actually do the job. Then they help you land a position by partnering with a wide range of tech companies who are hiring from them. Check out some of their stories of people like Kyle who went from being a 37 year old assembly line worker pressing buttons with no degree to making over 150k in a medical technology sales career or Dila who served duty in the military and didn't know what to do afterwards to making over 100k as a cyber security tech sales rep working fully remote so great as a side venture too. go to coursecareers.com link is in the bio to sign up for their free introduction course where you will learn exactly how you can start a high paying technology career without a degree or previous experience Although clearly talented at it, Carl's tired of betting on the fate of acquisitions from the sidelines. He wants to play. And one day in the 1970s, he gets an idea. Carl has seen acquisitions drive up stock prices and make shareholders like himself money time and time again. His big idea is instead of betting on the odds of a company acquiring another, he wants to take a more hands-on approach. He wants to get in early, scoop up cheap shares of underperforming companies and then orchestrate a takeover. The best part? Carl already has a target in mind. Well, we believe the company was very undervalued and tap and fit the program for me where I was embarking on activism. Could be a takeover candidate being blocked by, you know, the CEO and a board. CEO was a very strong personality, but I don't think he knew much about the business. On January the 5th, 1978, Icon makes his first move. He picks up the phone and he calls Tappan CEO Donald Blasius. 
the two exchange pleasantries. Icon says he's just calling to introduce himself and that he's bought some shares of Tappan on behalf of his clients and himself. In fact, Icon tells Donald he might even be making a sizable investment in Tappan down the road. And he thought it best to give him a heads up now. Of course, Icon wouldn't want to startle Donald with a sudden purchase of shares. Finally, Icon asks some innocent questions about the firm before hanging up the phone. Donald thinks nothing of the call. Another large stockbroker buying on behalf of clients. One can only imagine Icon grinning devilishly. It had been easier than he thought. Like any good tactician, he presents himself to Donald as polite, friendly and maybe even a bit slow. In truth, however, Icon is only patting his back to find a good spot for the knife. Almost two months pass before Carl calls Donald a second time. Since then, he's done exactly what he said he would. He's bought drastically more shares and says he's betting on Tappan being taken over or bought out. But when asked if Icon personally intended on executing a takeover, Icon assured Donald that they were not in the takeover business. Straight after the call, he buys even more shares, increasing his stake to $3 million. Now that Donald trusts Carl, Carl keeps testing him. On May the 9th, Carl hosts a meeting with Tappan management and tries to arrange a marriage between Tappan and another huge appliance company. But Blasius won't have it and the deal falls through. So Icon goes on the offensive. He buys even more shares. At this point he owns 5% of Tappan. Again, Carl soothes Blasius' suspicions by assuring him again that this isn't the start of a takeover. Meanwhile, Carl eagerly keeps trying to find companies who'll buy the company. So long as Tappan gets bought out, Carl is bound to make a tidy profit. Issue is, Donald and the rest of Tappan management won't have it. On the 20th of February 1979, almost a year since he bought his first shares in Tappan, Icon unveils his killer move. He calls Donald Blasius and he asks for the unthinkable. Icon asks to be added to the board of directors. A cold, calculated play. Icon being a director would mean he has a say in how the company is run. Donald sees Icon as a barbarian at the gate and sternly refuses. Icon simply shrugs. You either give him what he wants or he takes it and the time for asking is over. For the first time in the more than year-long saga, Tappan strikes back. Likely threatened by the more brazen attacks by Icon, Donald Blasius, CEO and head of the board, rallies his directors and launches a missile. They are going to issue preferred shares. Normal shares usually get one vote each, but preferred shares are like shares on steroids, where one preferred share can give you two, five, ten votes each. If Tappan succeeds in creating these shares, then they'll have more control over the vote and it's game over for Icon. But to create these shares on steroids, it needs to pass a vote first, one amongst all shareholders. The vote is scheduled to take place in one month. It's little time, Icon's on the back foot and the stage is set for one final confrontation. The pressure's on, millions of dollars are on the line, but it's more than that. Everything's at stake for Icon, his reputation, his clients and most of all the priceless satisfaction of winning. And so, with everything on the line, Icon drops the facade once and for all. He uses the ace tucked away in his sleeve. He declares war. Proxy war. A soon to be trademark icon move, he writes an open letter to all the shareholders of Tappan asking for their vote to elect him as a director. And he does it by raking Tappan management over hot coals. He also dangles the mouth watering profits shareholders could receive if Tappan was acquired. According to Icon, if Tappan is acquired, shareholders would more than double their investment. How can they say no? And when the day of the vote rolls around, Icon has been successful in riling up the shareholders and turning them against management. The steroid shares idea never sees the light of day, and feeling the pressure, management cave and reluctantly make Icon a director. There's still skirmishes now that Icon's rubbing shoulders with his rivals, but Tappan's fate was sealed the moment they let the fox in the henhouse. 
now calls Unstoppable and before long Tappen sold to Electrolux, a Swedish multinational. Icon makes out like a bandit, raking in a 2.7 million dollar profit, doubling his initial investment in two years. Even better, he did exactly what he said he would and his clients and the Tappen shareholders now suddenly richer rever him like a god. And if all that wasn't enough, that same year he gets married to Liba Trebal, a 20-year-old ballerina who gets pregnant 8 months later. Amidst all the celebrating, the shaking of hands and clinking of glasses, Icon slips away somewhere quiet. His confidence in his takeover idea has been bolstered by his recent success and he's already got the next victim in sight. What's happened to Donald, you ask? Well, he doesn't last long at the new Tappan. Lastly, as the saying goes, if you can't beat him, join him. A good sport, Tappan president Dick Tappan thanks Icon. He too was enriched by the takeover and saw how if done right, could reap huge rewards. So he invests in Icon's future conquests. You know his only regret? That he didn't invest more. After Tappan, Carl Icahn goes on the war path. Carl Icahn is back in the news. Icahn is the man who's been changing the face of American business with his threatened or actual takeovers of dozens of companies. He bought his first small company, Bayswater Realty. Next came a series of lawsuits and raids on some big names, like Marshall Field, Hammer Mill Paper, Dan River, and American Can, Phillips Petroleum, Uniroyal, and TWA. TWA. Carl Icahn had 17 or 18 practice runs before he started in on us. Recently, he arranged a blockbuster deal to take over Transworld Airlines. The price is now close to a billion dollars, which he's still raising. Icon managed to get something TWA's management could not get, labor concessions. Carl Icahn, unfair to flight attendants. He was seen as ruthless because he fired people, slashed salaries, cut roots. The management of TWA, it's true, should have done this a long time ago. And as the company went into bankruptcy, siphoned off money for himself. I own it. It's my money. I worry about the bottom line because if I lose, you know, I'm answerable to my bank account. Texaco and rest. ACF Industries, chairman of the board of Trans World Airlines. He is the largest shareholder in Texaco, holding 17.3% of Texaco's outstanding stock and also the largest shareholder in U.S. Steel. Motorola. Motorola is a perfect example of how Carl Icahn operates. First, he chooses a company he thinks is poorly run and trading below value. Two years ago, he started buying up millions of shares of Motorola. Now, he controls over a billion dollars worth of stock. As he usually does, he's been making demands in order to jolt up the sagging stock price. First one, dump the CEO. Why does everybody say that you're the man everybody loves to hate? Love to hate? Well, you're hurting my feelings. Carl hones his takeover playbook into a finely tuned weapon. What Carl does is named activism investing. Carl is one of the first activist investors and he's arguably the best. The stocks that we became activists in, their values went up $55 billion. In essence, Carl goes after companies that he thinks are deeply undervalued. I mean, that's the real secret. You, bu you buy things it sounds very simple, but it's very hard to do. When everybody hates it, you buy them. And then, and then when everybody wants them, you sell it to them. When he thinks that the company's cheapness is because of something fixable, like poor management or poor decision making. You have people that run companies that aren't bad people, but shouldn't be running the companies. There are very many companies where, and it's nobody's fault really. The CEO doesn't care, he's making a lot of money. All Carl has to do to make money is pressure management to make changes, or if necessary, force them. Why is there the great divergence between real value of a company and what it's selling for? <laughs> Ask yourself, why will somebody be willing to pay $60 for a Phillips Petroleum without management, but only $35 with management? What does that say about management? It's sort of simple. A corporation plus management is worth half of what a corporation is worth without management. And he has an arsenal of tools to turn the heat up on management, like proxy fighting or personally gaining majority control of the company. Carl starts building a reputation as a corporate raider and companies even begin to pay him off like a mob boss just to stay safe. Paying Icon to go away, buying back his stock at a premium price. 
That's called green mail. So I come outside with him and said, look, he said, they don't like you at all. If you start buying more stock, we're going to dilute the hell out of you. He said, now on the other side of the coin, we'll give you, you don't have the stock too long, we'll give you a $10 million profit to walk away. He looks at me and says, do you want some time to think about it? I said, no, I'll take the $10 million. <laughs> As time goes by, Carl tackles bigger and bigger opponents with ease. But he's about to go head to head with another notorious business giant, Bill Ackman. Wall Street is a pool filled with hungry sharks trying to make it big in business. Among the wannabe Excel monkeys at investment banks, there are a few that actually made it. One of them is Bill Ackman. What happens when two titans collide? The world starts shaking. In this case, at least the world of finance. But let's start at the beginning. Back in 2003, a feud develops between Ackman and Carl Icahn. The two participate in a deal involving the real estate company Hallwood Realty. Ackman is intimidated and wants to get out of the deal as fast as possible. Long story short, Ackman sells his stake to Carl for $80 a share. They agree that if Icon sells the shares at a 10% profit or more within three years, they will split the returns. Hallwood Realty gets acquired by another real estate firm for 136 US dollars a share, an increase of 70% within a single year. That's when Icon decides to apply some Wolf of Wall Street tactics. Call says F you and refuses to pay Bill the bill, who of course hates him for it. Instantly, Ackman takes Call to court and after an eight year long legal battle, Icon is forced to pay 4.5 million US dollar plus 9% interest per year by the court. Money wise, it's peanuts to him. But he absolutely hates getting shown up and vows to get even. When Bill is seemingly on the trade of his life, Icon decides to throw a spanner in the works. In 2012, Ackman enters into a short position worth $1 billion, betting against the supplement company Herbalife. Yeah, that Herbalife. The price has already sunk significantly and Bill claims he's doing God's work. He couldn't be more wrong. Betting against a company is always risky, especially one that makes money off idiots. Icon is looking to take revenge and buys into the seemingly dying company, raising the share price to new highs. It's almost like a tug of war. Icon's position to make money if the stock price goes up, Bill if the stock price goes down. One thing's for sure, someone's going to get burned. This back and forth leads to the pair appearing in the most legendary TV interview ever. And I'm telling you, he's like the crybaby in the schoolyard. You know, I went to a tough school in Queens and they used to beat up the little Jewish boys and he was like one of these little Jewish boys crying that the world was taking advantage of him. Now, I was concerned about dealing with Carl Icahn because Carl Icahn, unfortunately, does not have a good reputation. This is not an honest guy and this is not a guy who keeps his word and this is a guy who takes, takes advantage of little people. Ackman is a liar. Their fight goes on until Ackman eventually has to get out of the trade with massive losses while Carl laughs all the way to the bank. If you want to hear the other side of the story, let me tell you that we also produced a full biography on Bill Ackman. Make sure to check it out as well. And while you're at it, why the hell haven't you subscribed and turned on the bell notifications yet? Shame on you. Carl Icahn is one of the most feared investors on Wall Street. He brought activist investing into the mainstream. He also has one of the most impressive takeover track records in history. And while people label him a corporate raider or a Robin Hood unto himself, Carl will say that more people should do what he does. Challenge leadership, voice your complaints, because that's how things get better. No matter which side you fall on, one thing's for sure. Shareholders love him. Remember to go to coursecareers.com, link is in the description if you want to start a new high paying career in tech without a degree or experience required.